Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahibi ajmain. Amma abad. A'udhu billahi minash shaytani rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika balikma. Wal ma'azid al hasna. Wajadu milladhi ahsan. Rabbi shari sadi. Wa silli amri. Wa halul ugdad min lisani hafka wa kawli. I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla, and the Peace TV Chinese, as well as the viewers on the social media platform, which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram, and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're most welcome to this program. Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 12, Session 2. Here you're most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and compassion religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have asked and you are unable to reply or questions that you find on the media against Islam. This is the opportunity. The best would be you can ask your questions on any of the social media, whether it be Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram. But the best would be to ask on the WhatsApp as a text message mentioning the question in brief along with your name, your profession, and the city and country where you come from to the whatsapp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero i repeat plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero before we take the questions from the whatsapp i would like to reaffirm to our brothers and sisters in palestine especially in gaza that we stand in solidarity with you. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day and every salah for your safety, for your security, for your steadfastness. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase your iman, increase your taqwa. And the Muslims all over the world, we are increasing our faith. The videos that we see that are being live telecast it's the first time in the history of humankind that a genocide is being telecast live by the people on whom the genocide is being done and this war between israel and palestine this is the 105th day about three and a half months have passed and more than 25,000 palestinians have been killed and more than 62,000 have been injured. I'm sure Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you immensely for this. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant Janet Firdos to all the martyrs who have died in Palestine. And I would like to inform you that the full world is in your support. Not only the Muslims, the majority of the non-Muslims are in your support. There is a small minority which is supporting Israel. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he give you victory. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that may Allah solve your problems. And inshallah, inshallah, through all this event, surely it's going to be a lesson for all the human beings in the world. And, and it is a reminder for us that, mashallah, all the people in Gaza, in Palestine, you're supporting the third holiest mosque in Islam, the third, third holiest site in Islam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you the best in this world and the akhirah. We'll take the first question from the WhatsApp. <coughs> Hello. Mr. Zakir Naik. It's Iman from Afghanistan. I'm 15 years old and I'm a Muslim. I have two questions. When does Salah become fard for a person? Is it the age of puberty or age of 10? Number two, what should we do about missed prayers? I unfortunately missed prayers for years. Should we just repent or cover it? And if I must cover it, how many years should I cover because I became adult in 14 and now I'm 15. Should I cover just one year or five years? The question posed 
by Iman from Afghanistan is that at what age should a person at what age does it become fard for a person to offer salah is it the age of puberty or the age of 10 first the name iman is also of a girl also of a boy so i don't know whether the question posed by the questioner is it a male or is it a female is it a girl or is it a boy we know that you are 15 years old but we don't know whether you're a girl or a boy because iman is a word is a name used for man as well it's used for a boy as well as for a girl but irrespective of what it is the correct age at which the salah becomes fard is at the age of puberty and the age of puberty differs between different people between different sex whether it's male or female whether you're coming from a cold country or a hot country whether you're living in india or afghanistan or usa it differs if you're a girl the right age is at puberty when you start having menstrual cycle a girl can start having menstrual cycle even normally it's between the age of 13 14 sometime it can be even 12 it can even be 10 i being a doctor i'm aware that girls even at the age of nine they start the menstrual cycle so the day a girl starts having menstrual cycle is the day she reaches puberty and from that time it becomes further on her to offer salah and for a boy also so the average age may be 13 14 sometimes it can relate to the age of 15 and since you said that you reach puberty at the age of 14 so that from that time salah becomes first for you if you're a boy but naturally from the time you start having pubic hair and the signs of puberty comes that's the time when salah becomes first and for a boy also it's similar it may be the age of 14 can be 15 can be 13 it varies between individual so as far as far as you are concerned since you said that you reach the age of puberty at, at the age of 14 then your salah becomes fard from the age of 14 and you said that now you're age of 15 so you missed your fard salah for one year not five years you're getting a question that should you cover up or should you catch up or should you make up for the fard salah that you have missed for the past one year or should you just repent there are two opinions for this there's one opinion which says that you should make up for it and as many times as you offer your fard or zohar or asar or maghrib or isha at the same time you keep on offering an additional for the time that you have missed this is one opinion but the more correct opinion is that if you have missed the salah intentionally and purposefully there is no expiation our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, mentioned in Hadith of Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, that if a person forgets to offer salah, there is no there is no expiation, there is no expiation, and the moment he remembers, he should offer it. Another narration says that if a person sleeps and doesn't offer salah, the moment he wakes up, the moment he remembers, he should offer. There is no expiation for that. The moment he wakes up, he should offer salah. So based on these and various say hadith, the Prophet was very emphatic and clear that if you forget, if you miss your salah because of forgetfulness or because you're sleeping like Fajr Salah, you, you oversleep. So there's no expatiation for it. And the moment you remember it, you should pray it immediately. You should not wait till your next salah is there. Immediately and Allah will not hold responsible. There's no sin on that. So the second opinion, which is the correct opinion of the scholars, is that if you miss it intentionally, out of laziness, or saying, okay, I'll read after, after, then the salah time is over, or you know it is far, then you may only offer once in a day, or you may not offer at all for many years. According to the second opinion, which is the more correct opinion, there is no expiation for the salah that you have intentionally missed. It is a major sin it is a major sin so if you intentionally miss any salah it's a major sin and the only remedy for this is that you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you ask for forgiveness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you repent and inshallah Allah will forgive you and to compensate for that which you have missed 
there is no expiation but the scholars say that you can increase your nawafil salah your sunnah salah the sun the sunnah moqda the sunnah gair moqda you increase that and do more good deeds for example give more charity give more of donation fi sabilillah so do more good deeds which will compensate for the sins you have done but you don't have to repeat the salah you have missed and this is the more correct and the authentic opinion which was even followed by the second caliph of islam that is umar ibn khattab may allah be pleased with him including his son abdul ibn umar and various sahabas so there are various hadith that reaffirms that for this it's a sin and there is no compensation like don't have to repeat your salah it's a sin you have to ask for forgiveness and this was the view which was also there by ibn hazm uh, may allah have mercy on him even by sheikh al islam ibn taymiyah ibn even by ibn qayyum even by shawqani all these scholars even by contemporary scholars whether it be sheikh bin baz sheikh utaimin sheikh nasir dalmani all of them say that if you miss your salah intentionally then you don't have to repeat it you have to ask for forgiveness and do more good deeds for the charity more of nawafil salah more of the sunnah salah and this is the correct opinion even those people who say that you have to read they don't say that once you read it is like you know if you have forgotten and if you offer your salah immediately when remember there's no sin they don't say that if you have missed and if you offer salah there's no sin they say that it's a major sin but if you read then your sin becomes less but the more correct opinion is what i gave earlier that you don't have to repeat it because imagine suppose you realize at the age of 50 that i should offer salah and the time that you had to offer salah was when you became an adult when you reached puberty maybe at the age of 40 so now you say for 36 years i did not offer salah now if i have to read for all the 36 years will i live that long so maybe you say okay since i did not read salah for 36 years i will not read for the rest of the life so logically also it doesn't make sense you have to ask for forgiveness inshallah i'll forgive you you can read as many more sunnah salah salah sunnah muqadda sunnah ghair muqadda tahajjud salah and do other good deeds like extra fasting and giving more charity so this opinion which is more authentic opinion so for you also you missed your salah for one year because you reached puberty at the age of 14 but you don't have to repeat those salah which you missed for one year just see to it that you increase your nawafil you offer your sunnah muqadda ghair muqadda offer your tahajjud offer the offer the in the last one third of night fast more give more charity inshallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase in your blessings hope that's the question The second question from WhatsApp Assalamu alaikum Dr Saheb wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Muhammad Nawaz university teacher from Peshawar Pakistan Alhamdulillah I have studied the Quran I want to study other religions what we should I adopt to study comparative religion if there are your lectures in which you have taught the way so please share the link The brother said that he has studied the Quran. He wants to study comparative religion. So, can I guide him? Which lecture should he refer to? Is there any talk of mine, any program where I teach about comparative religion? There are many of my talks, my public lectures, which are on comparative religion, and there are books written by me. Since you are from Pakistan, you can surely, in the religions that you should concentrate more. on comparative religion is hinduism and christianity since these two religion are the religions which are maximum followed uh, besides islam so if you want to study 
on compassion religion Hinduism, my talk on similarities between Hinduism and Islam is a very good talk. You can even refer to my talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the various world religious scriptures. You can refer to my talk on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Hindu scriptures. There is also a talk of mine, concept of God in major world religions. Regarding Hinduism, you can refer to my talk as well as my book on similarities between Islam and Christianity. You can refer to my book on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the Bible. And the other lectures and books on concept of God in major world religion, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the various world religious scriptures, and various lectures of mine are there on compassion religion, like Salah, the program into righteousness. These talks, if you hear, it is mainly based on one of the important verses of Dawah, where Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, Kul Yahal al-Kitab, see your people of the book. Ta'alo ila kalimatin sawa im bainana minakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term, Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but Allah. Wala nushika bihi shayyaw. That we associate no partner with him. Wala yittakhida baaduna baadun arba bin minin illah. That we erect not among ourselves. Lords and pit other than Allah. Fain tawallah. Then if you turn back. Faqulu shaddu. Say ibe witness. Be anna muslimun. That we are muslims. Bawing awil to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the master key for dawah. Allah says, Ta'alo ila kalimatin sawa im bainan wa bainakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. So while doing da'wah to a non-Muslim, it's very important that if you start with common terms, inshallah you'll be able to break the ice and you'll be successful. So you can start talking about common terms and Allah reminds us here in this verse. The most important is Allah, na'buda illallah, that we worship them but Allah. Wala nushrika bhi shayyam, that we associate no partner with him. That we associate no partner with him. So while you're doing da'wah, you can start with things which are common, for example, science or maybe literature or whatever you feel is common between the person you're speaking and yourself or the religion who you're talking about and Islam. But your main aim should be Tawheed. You may convince him to be truthful, you may convince him not to have alcohol, you may convince him not to have pork, but if you do not remove the shirk from the life of your friend or the person you're talking to, your dawah is useless. The most important is Tawheed. You can talk about other things, but the most important is Tawheed. If you are not able to remove the shirk in his life, if you are not able to instill Tawheed, your dawah is useless. So in comparative religion, the most important point of comparative religion is the concept of God in major world religions. If you are speaking to a Christian, you should try and prove Tawheed from the Bible. First you have to prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. He never claimed divinity. And we can prove from the Bible, and I say that in my talk and in my book, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that he is God or he says worship me. Where he says I am God or he says worship me. And you can hear my talks. So similarly when you are doing dawah to a Hindu, your first concept should be that you should remove the idol worship from the life of the Hindu. Prove to him that according to the Veda, there is one God, you should worship him alone, Almighty God has got no image. So your first aspect of Dawa is Tawheed, concept of one God, that we worship him alone and no one else. So while doing Dawa, this is the most important aspect. So first you should master the commonalities between the concept of God and Islam and other religion and try and win him over to Tawheed. The second most important aspect while doing Dawa which is the pillar of Islam, first pillar, we bear witness that there is no God but Allah and we bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. The second aspect of Dawah is to prove to the non-Muslim that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can start with, you know, proving him about science, if you think he is a man of science, no problem, but your final goal should be first Tawheed, second is the Risala, that Prophet Muhammad is the last and final messenger. As I mentioned earlier, I have given talks on this topic. Muhammad, peace be upon him in the Bible. Muhammad, peace be upon him in the Hindu scriptures. Muhammad, peace be upon him in the world religious scriptures. And then you can go on for Akhira and for Salah and various aspects. But these two are the most important aspects. And if you are able to convince the non-Muslim on these two aspects, he can enter the fold of Islam. The remaining will follow. As far as 
knowing the structure or how should you be well versed in compassionate religion or how should you do dawa i would i would advise you that you can visit our platform al hidayah al hidayah is the largest islamic platform islamic video on demand platform in the world it has the largest number of islamic courses in the world there are more than 200 islamic courses on that out of which many of the courses are by me and many on comparative religion and there are thousands of hours of islamic video on this platform this platform is absolutely free you can visit it and there is a course which is called as let's become effective dai the international dawa training program it's a long course and if you take this course you know there's a study guide there are questions inshallah that will help you a lot in the comparative religion and will help you to become a good dai also hope that answers the question <clears throat> Can you put the Facebook, please? <clears throat> the third question from the WhatsApp: Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Sadiq. I am a student from Kolkata, India. My question is. I invested money on a halal company's shares three months earlier, but recently I checked that the company has become haram because interest-bearing debt to total assets has exceeded to forty-three point seven five percent, due to which the stock has become haram. But previously the stock was halal. What should I do? the question posed by brother sadik that invested in halal shares and maybe he has knowledge about how to invest in stock which are sharia compliant and when he invested and when he bought these shares 3 months earlier these shares were halal but now when he checked up he came to know that the interest bearing ratio or the debt ratio has increased to more than 43% 43.75% so now it's become haram what should he do first if you have heard my answers on how do you come to know whether the the stocks you are purchasing of a particular company should be compliant or not and there are five categories the first is that the core activity should be halal and then you should see to it that they are not in, involved in any any interest bearing activity as as a as a company which is giving loan on interest etc then the cash and the debt ratio should be less and the any haram activity should be less than 5% these these were discussed in detail so the brother may have checked and he realized after 3 months that the debt ratio has increased to more than 43% and that makes the share haram what should he do he should immediately sell the share sell the share and invest in a halal share but while investing see to it that there are two types of sharia compliant one is that the company itself has a sharia board and it is sharia compliant by nature by nature means it has a board so investing in sharia compliant shares which has a sharia board is the best and malaysia where i live there are many sharia compliant shares and it is there in the stock itself it mentioned sharia compliant halal okay not sharia compliant in india there are very few which are basically which have a sharia board etc hardly any but even if it doesn't have a sharia board it can be sharia compliant by nature because it may not be a debt company it may not be taking loans the the core activity may not be haram it may be dealing with maybe pharmaceuticals so by nature it can be so some companies by nature if they don't have a sharia board also it can remain halal but some company can keep on changing like the one you said you invest in a company and and that company has got involved into uh, debt you know so in this you have to keep on monitoring but the best is to invest in shares which has a, invest in companies which has a sharia board the second best would be by nature if it is sharia compliant 
you know, you know that the company will not involve in taking loan from the bank and by nature it is such a company, it is a strong company, it's a big company and it's involved in products which are, uh, which are halal. And then the third would be the company which, which may keep on changing. So it is preferable to avoid investing in companies which can change because you have to keep on monitoring and then if it's haram you have to sell it. So why let you in, involve in investing even for a small period, whether it be a month or whether it be a week. So best is to involve in companies which have a Sharia board, as I mentioned. Second best is by nature if it's Sharia compliant. But now the solution for you is that see to it to sell it immediately. If you want to continue investing in Sharia compliant shares, see to it that you invest in a company which has a Sharia board or by nature it is Sharia compliant. Hope that answers the question. Next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Umair. I'm from Bangalore, India. I work as an operations manager. I have a young daughter whom I want to admit into an Islamic school. The Islamic school is very far from my home. We have a convent school right beside our home. My wife argues that we put her in the convent school as it is close to our home. She cites reasons such as it is unsafe to send a girl child far nowadays. But I want to put her in an Islamic school so that she can stay away from shirk, have an Islamic environment and at the same time gain worldly progress. I do not, I do not mind risking her sending far away. I have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he will protect her if I strive in his way. How do I convince my wife? Brother Umair has asked a very good question that he wants to send his young child, the young daughter, to an Islamic school. But the wife is, is insisting that since the Islamic school is very far, better put in a school which is close by even though it's convent because it's not safe to put the child in a school which is far away. Basically, let me tell you that Bangalore is a safe city. Bangalore is not like Manhattan of New York or Bronx or, you know, it's a safe city. <coughs> I've been to Bangalore many times, I have many friends. So, if your child is going to school, she's going to go at daytime. So, I don't think so. It is unsafe to send your child, your daughter, to a school which is far away, it may be half an hour, it may be one hour. See to it that you arrange a proper transportation, whether it be a school bus, whether it be a proper vehicle, which is secure, I don't think so. It is, it is risky. But what you have to realize that I do agree with Omer, your husband, because he is striving for the Akhara. Imagine if you are putting your daughter in a convent school, and she starts believing that Jesus is God or she starts worshiping Jesus Christ be upon him. Will you be able to forgive yourself? You know, many a time people give the excuse that the school is far, therefore I'm not sending. Maybe they are more impressed by the standard of the convent school as compared to Islamic schools. But I'm aware that Alhamdulillah in Bangalore, there are many Islamic schools. You have a lot of options. You can surely choose the school you feel has a better standard which is more close to Quran and Sunnah. And even if hypothetically, if the standard is less than the convent school, which is close to your house, it is preferable and safer to put your child, whether your daughter or a son, in Islamic school rather than a convent school, because there are high chances that your child may go away far from your deen. So I do agree with Omer that, and I completely support him. And I would like to remind the sister that please don't be so much relaxed and not at all worried about putting your child in a convent school, there are high dangers that they may go far away from the deen. It is more dangerous than the danger you are thinking that's unsafe for a girl to travel. Because if she goes far away from the deen, that is multiple times more dangerous, more harmful, more, more un-Islamic than talking about the safety of your child. So please, I request sister, that see to it that, and Allah is there to protect you. If you, and I do agree with the statement of Omer, that if he's striving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
surely Allah will protect and Bangalore is a safe city. How many cases have you heard that young girls going in Bangalore to school which are far they have got problem? Hardly any cases. So and even if it's far and if it's tiring, Allah will support you. You will get a better ajar. And one more thing, it's good for you also. Because the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when a person dies, only three things continue as sawabhijariya. One is the wealth that you have spent in his way. One is the knowledge that you spread about him, about the deen. And the third is pious children praying for you. So if your child is pious and prays for you, you will benefit. If your child is not pious, then it will get no benefit for you in the akhirah. So it will not only benefit the child, it will benefit you also if you put in a good, authentic Islamic school. Hope that answers the question. We have on the WhatsApp Rahib Ahmed. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum salam. Umm Habiba, you have Muhibul Ansari, Muhammad Saklain Safrullah, Raja Khan, Muhammad Taseem Ali Babu, Fad Al Hassan, Firoz Al Mamun. Mehdi Hassan Miras, Rafiqul Islam, Muhammad Tuhin Ahmad, Kurban Ali, Abdul Qayyum Mullah, Parvez Khan, Muhammadi S, Sheikhu Bukharia, Ilyas Shikdar, Muhammad Rayhan, Muhammad Rayyan, Tushar Khan, Musayb Mushtaq, Kavith Sliman Surshi, Musayb Mushtaq. They are saying, Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam. Many of them are praying for me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even grant you the best in this world and the akhirah. We have on the YouTube Huria Farooq Malik, Muhammad Zihad Hassan, Sahil Masi, Tuhin Reza, Hamad Nasir Awan, Caesar, Ispahani Ajad, Huria Farooq Malik, Aryan. Saifullah Khan, Sifata Tafreen, Tanvir Hassan, Muhammad Zihad Hassan, Tahura Barin, Gabru, Muhammad Zihad Hassan, Muhammad Shahid, Many are saying Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam. Many of them are doing duas for me. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even grant you the best in this world and the akhirah.
the question posed by a sister on the YouTube, if I sew such clothes which expose the upper part of the chest, the cleavage and the shoulder don't show, cleavage and shoulder don't show, so is it halal earning or haram? I believe the question posed is that talking about a tailor stitching clothes for a lady where the upper part of the chest is seen and the cleavage and the shoulder is seen, so is it halal to stitch such clothes? First you should realize what is the purpose of these clothes. You know, normally when you stitch undergarments, but natural, it's possible to show the cleavage and it's perfectly fine because the clothes worn under, under the other clothes. But if there are other clothes where you know that a lady is wearing clothes only amongst the ladies and if some part of the body is exposed then it's not haram. But wearing such clothes otherwise outside, it is not permitted. So depending upon the clothes that if you know that you are stitching clothes for ladies who are going to wear an abaya on top of that, then it's perfectly fine. But if you know that you are stitching designer clothes and people wear these clothes, not wearing clothes, not wearing a coat over it or wearing an abaya over it, and if you are aware of it, stitching such clothes is not permitted. Because Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, that help one another in righteousness and taqwa. Do not help one another in sin and rancor. So if you are making clothes which you are aware that ladies will be wearing for parties and exposing the body and would be involved in things which are haram, then it is not correct to stitch such clothes. But if you know these clothes are worn at home, it's not worn, the ladies are not going to wear it in front of the Nam Aram. There are some Muslim countries where you know people wear abaya. So if you know that it is not going to involve any haram action then there's no problem but if you're aware that this will be worn by ladies who normally go for parties outside and they don't wear the hijab and you're specially catering to them then it is not permitted for you to help them in doing haram activity you should not stitch that clothes so depending upon how it's going to be used and you as a tailor know better your customers so based on that you have to decide whether or what you're doing is haram or halal hope that answers the question The question posed by Sultan on the YouTube is Assalamu alaikum sir, wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. My question is, is there anyone alive in this world currently who will not receive a single guna in Jahannam? If I understand the question correctly, the questioner is asking that is there anyone currently living who will not get a punishment for single guna in Jahannam? The answer is different. If the question is, is there anyone living today who has not done a single sin, then the answer is no. The only people who are sinless are the Anbiya, the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, I don't know of anyone living today in the world who has not done a single sin. But if the question is, that is there anyone who will not receive punishment in the Jannah? Inshallah, there will be many. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to forgive someone, even after he has committed sin, if the person repents, inshallah, Allah is Rahman or Rahim, is Ghafur or Rahim. And there are various hadith in which, the, in which uh, the Prophet said that if the servants of Allah sin during night and if they ask for forgiveness in the morning, Allah will forgive them. If they sin the full day and they ask forgiveness in the night, Allah will forgive them. So if a person does sin and if he repents sincerely and there is two types of forgiveness. One is maqfira where Allah forgives even Allah forgives on the day of judgment Allah will question you for that sin but he will not punish you for that because Allah has forgiven you there is one type of it is rafah Allahumma inna ka afoon tuhibbul afu afafwani so here the afu that is there is forgiveness with removing any record Allah will not question you 
if Allah forgives you in the higher level, may Allah will not question you. So the sin you have done, Allah will not question you on the day of judgment even about that. So that type is the higher forgiveness. So, is there any human being who will not be punished in Jahannam for a single sin? Yes, there will be many. Those people who repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who are sincere, inshallah there will be many. But if you ask, is there any human being who has not committed a single sin now living on the face of the earth? Then the answer is no. Hope that answers the question. Question posed by Ishfaq Bashir. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Ishfaq from Kashmir. Why Muslim countries not unite against Israel? That's a very good question. But that question should not be posed to me. It should be posed to the leaders of the country. If you heard my talk on the 15 point action plan for the Muslim Ummah in relation to Palestine. And my last two points, I mentioned that if all the Muslim countries unite and if they stand unitedly, then inshallah, no non-Muslim will try and interfere with us. And how the non-Muslims have a NATO, North Atlantic Alliance, North Atlantic treaty organization NATO where there are about 30 31 countries are member and according to their treaty if anyone attacks any one of the 31 country it is as though you have attacked all the 31 countries so if all the Muslim majority countries all the 57 countries they gather together and they unite and if they made MECTO Muslim Alliance treaty organization or Muslim country treaty organization MECTO Muslim countries treaty organization and if you have the same rule that if you attack any one of the 57 countries, it is as though you have attacked all the countries, then we will not have the problem what we are having today regarding the genocide that Israel is doing in Palestine. You are asking me? This is the solution I gave. So you should ask the rulers of the Muslim countries, why are they not uniting? And we have to realize that I am aware that the non-Muslims have got a lot of arms and ammunition, they have got nuclear power, they have got wealth, they have got, uh, they have got the military, but we fail to realize that we have Allah with us. And Allah with us is more important than all the power that they have. But unfortunately, we Muslims are weak. And this reminds me of the hadith of a Prophet that there will be a time when Muslims will be attacked. So the one of the Sahabas, they'll be looked down upon, they'll be ill-treated. So the Sahabas asked that, will the Muslims will be less in numbers? The Prophet said, no, they will be in large numbers, but they'll be like froth. Froth, large in number, but useless. They'll not be united. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 103, Hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. So, I, my solution that to have these problems, what is having, see anything, Imagine if, if Israel was alone and if Muslim Palestinians were alone fighting them, inshallah they would have won them lock, stock in battle. Even though they are very weak, they are less equipped. But if it's a war only between Israel and Palestine, I am sure that the Muslims, even if they are less equipped, even if they have lesser army, lesser equipment, yet According to me, they will win them lock, stock and battle. But you have the huge superpowers in the world, America supporting them. You have UK supporting them. And what are the Muslim countries doing? Nothing. It's a shame on us. That imagine all the superpowers are gathering together and they're attacking a Muslim country who gave refuge to the Jews inviting them to stay and now they're kicking them out of the house and these people who are terrorists are now calling the Muslim Palestinians the terrorists. And what are we doing? Nothing. 
So we Muslims should unite. And there are alliances you can do. And profited alliance. If we want to do alliance, surely the Muslim countries get together and do alliance with Russia or with China. If Muslim countries join hand with Russia and China and then make an alliance, I am sure no of none of these non-Muslim countries like like USA, like UK, like France, they have history. UK has a history and France and Germany, they have a history that they rule about two-thirds of the world. They came and they ruled India, they came and they ruled Malaysia, many countries in the world. They have a habit of interfering with other people and they say we are doing it for the benefit. So what we should do, we should join hands, make alliance with countries like Russia, like country like China and have an alliance. Allah has given us the black gold. We have control of the petrol. So if the Muslim countries get together and we know the major oil producing countries are Muslim. The major export of the oil is Muslim and oil is required even for weaponry, even for fighting. If all the Muslim countries get together, Allah has given us resources. Palm oil, 90% of the palm oil is with Indonesia and Malaysia. 60% Indonesia, 30% Malaysia. So all the resources Allah has given us, if we have an alliance of the Muslim countries for trade, for business, for military, like if they have the Interpol, international police, we should have the Islam pool, Islamic police. Why should we be dependent on them? So if we collaborate and join hands together, not to bully others, they are doing it to bully others. They go and kill tens of thousands of Muslims in Afghanistan, in Iraq, now in Palestine. What are we doing? If we join hands together and unite on the basis of Quran and Sayyid Hadith, as Allah says, In Surah Imran chapter 3 verse 103, that hold all the Muslims, hold strongly to the rope of Allah and be not divided. Hold strongly to the Quran and Sayyid Hadith. So inshallah, I feel this is the only solution. Of course, there are Hadith and predictions of the Prophet that before the end of the world, Muslims inshallah will rule the world. There will a time come. Even irrespective whether the, whether the Muslims will follow or not, there will be a time towards the end of the world. Before the end of the world, the signs are coming. The, there are minor signs and major signs. Most of the minor signs have already come. Few are remaining. But before the end of the world, according to Sai Hadith, the Muslims will rule the world for seven years. For seven years, there will be peace and prosperity in the full world, where Muslims will rule the world as per the Quran and Sunnah. And later on, a sweet wind will come, all the Muslims will be, will, will be put to death very peacefully, and then the signs of Qiyamah will start. So, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know whether we'll be alive during that time or not, but at least we have to now support our Muslims and brothers, our, our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine. And we see that what's happening, the genocide that the Israelis are doing, and the so-called human rights champions, whether it be USA, whether it be UK, whether it be France, whether it be Germany, these so-called human rights champions, they are doing a genocide. They are doing the same thing what was done on them. But inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us. Whether some of the Muslims join us or not, inshallah, inshallah, a time will come that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us victory. And we as individuals should strictly follow the Quran and Sunnah. If we don't have the ability, see to it that we are prepared to follow the instructions given by Allah and His Rasul in the Quran and Sayyid Hadith, so that we get the best in this world and the Akhirah. Hope that answers the question.
There's a question asked on the YouTube by K Edits. Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Dr. Zakir, Karan, here a Muslim revert. My question is Are true Sikhs considered idol worshippers? Can a Muslim man marry a Sikh girl if they are considered? Idol of fire worshippers. If you have heard my talks on Sikhism, Sikhism actually is against idol worship. They are against Autar Vada, that Almighty God taking Autar. Sikh, a true Sikh who follows the scriptures, believe there is one God and they believe that Almighty God has got no image, He is all powerful. The concept of God in Sikhism is close to the concept of God in Islam. But it is the question is not that a Muslim cannot only marry an idol worshipper. A Muslim man or woman cannot marry a non-Muslim man or woman. The Quran says in Surah Bakra chapter 2 verse 221 that let that do not marry a believing woman. Let not a believing woman marry an unbelieving man. Or an idol worshipper until he believes a slave man who is a Muslim is far superior to a non Muslim, even if he allows you. He may be the most handsome man in the world, he may be the richest man in the world, he may be the king of, king of the world. But a believing man who is a bondsman, who is a slave man, Allah says, is better than an unbelieving man, even if he allows you. He may be most handsome, he may be the most richest. And the verse continues that do not marry unbelieving women. Or a mushrika. So the two things, idol worshipper or unbeliever means those who don't believe in Islam. Do not marry unbelieving women or a mushrika until they believe. A believing woman, a Muslima, even if she is a bond woman, she is much better than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. She may be a beauty queen, she may be the richest woman in the world, she may be a queen of the richest country in the world. But if she is an unbeliever, a Muslim woman who is a slave woman is far superior than an unbelieving woman even if she allows you. So based on this verse of the Quran, you cannot marry a non-Muslim. So the Sikh, even if it is a true Sikh following, who may not be doing idol worship, can you marry? No. You have to believe in the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. To marry, the person should be a Muslim, it's compulsory. Should be a Muslim and, and the Prophet said, that when you marry, when you look for a life partner, you look for four things. One is beauty, wealth, nobility and virtue, religion, that is deen. And the most important from most all is virtue, it is deen. So, unless the non-Muslim accepts Islam, you cannot marry a non-Muslim. Hope that answers the question. <clears throat> the next question from WhatsApp. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Jamal from India. I am involved in a business of wedding cards for the past six years. I have a doubt about selling wedding cards with non Muslim gods. Is it okay, sir? I have this doubt from the beginning. Some say it's okay and some say it's not okay to sell them. Please sir, give me a good knowledge about this. Thanks. The question posed is that is it permissible to sell wedding cards with photographs of non-Muslim gods or gods of non-Muslims? Actually, the God for Muslim and non-Muslim is the same as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
If you are saying that the, the gods with the non-Muslim worship, that's a different thing. So gods of the non-Muslim is the same, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Gods of all the human beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I know what your question was that, can you sell wedding cards on which there are photos of gods which are worshipped by non-Muslims? The answer to this is no. You cannot sell cards or sell goods on which there are photographs of the gods which are worshipped by non-Muslims. They are doing shirk and you are promoting it. If you are selling them cards with photographs of the gods which they think are gods and they worship and you sell it to them, what are you doing? You are helping them in shirk. It's totally haram. And there are various fatwas of, of top scholars including Ibn Taymiyyah that you cannot wish the non-Muslims during the festivals. You cannot take part in the celebration. You cannot help them to give them goods in which they are involved in doing wrong activity during the festival. So, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, that help one another in bir and taqwa, <coughs> in righteousness and piety, but do not help one another in sin and rancor. So what are you doing? You are giving them wedding card with the photographs of the false god which they worship. This is shirk. So helping them to do shirk. So you cannot sell any goods which promote things which are haram. And selling wedding cards or birthday cards or festival cards which have got photographs of non-Muslim god is haram. Or even selling goods which help them to celebrate the non-Muslim festivals. Encourage them. Or you are giving a discount on Christmas, saying that Christmas sale. Or saying that there is a Diwali sale and you are giving discount and you know trying to allure them. You can give them discount, there is no problem. But giving discount because it is Diwali. Or giving discount because it is Christmas. Trying to attract customers. This is haram. As per the verse of the Quran of Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 2, they do not help one another in sin and rancor. Hope that answers the question. Next question from WhatsApp. My name is Sayyid Haris. I am a medical student from India. My question is regarding the traditional medicines advised by or done by the Prophet. Are these methods told by the Prophet legislative and if we believe more in modern medicine, am I committing kufr because I am not having full faith in the words of the Prophet? The question posed by the brother is that our beloved Prophet has many hadiths talking about the medicines. It is known as Tibbi Nabwi. And the Prophet has various hadith talking about what will cure you, what will not cure you, talking about honey, talking blood seed and various hadith. So the question posed by a Muslim who is a medical student that if, is it kufr? If I practice something else, if I don't practice the medicine and if I practice like maybe allopathy or the mainstream medicine, so is it kufr? Is it wrong if I don't believe in the word of the Prophet? Regarding the last part of the question, is it wrong if I do not believe in the word of the Prophet? Yes, it is wrong. You have to believe in the word of the Prophet, but that doesn't mean you have to practice that medicine also. Practicing the medicine is not fard, because whatever the Prophet told about the medicine, if you follow it's a sunnah. The Prophet never said it is fard that you should take honey. The Prophet spoke about the benefits of honey. The, spoke, the Prophet spoke about the benefit of black seed, that <coughs> in this, there is cure for every disease except death. But that doesn't mean it's a fard. It is sunnah. It's sunnah the muqida. Prophet spoke about the miswak. That if you use the siwak, and the Prophet said, if it wasn't too difficult, I'd have made it fard for every Muslim to use the siwak before every salah. But he didn't do it. So using siwak is sunnah. So whatever the Prophet recommended, whether it, it is Tibbi Nabwi, whether it is cupping, whether it is honey, whether it is black seed, all these are sunnah. It is not a fard. It is not fard to do it. So, but you saying, you cannot say what the Prophet said is wrong. That is wrong. You cannot say, I don't believe in the hadith. That is kufr. If it is a Sahih hadith, Prophet said this, 
and if you deny it then that is kufr you cannot deny that but it's not a must that you should follow it if you're practicing it now you said you're a doctor and there is an allopathy medicine which may not follow the same what the prophet has said it's not wrong at all because allah says in the quran in sunnah hell chapter number 16 verse 43 and sorry ambiya chapter number 21 verse number 7 first alu if you don't know ask the person who is knowledgeable so if you get sick who will you ask you'll ask a doctor so now you're following the guidance of the doctors in today's world he may be an non-muslim no problem and the prophet was very clear there is hadith in which when people were hitting the plants and the prophet said what are you doing they threw the plants again the other plants and there is to be pollination the prophet said what are you doing don't do it so they didn't do it and that year the crop failed and then they realized that when they used to do those actions it was mainly helping in pollination and the crop was good so the prophet said these are worldly matters in worldly matters it's not necessary you have to follow everything what i say in matters of deen in religion yes you have to follow him blindly but in matter of worldly things you may or may not follow him it's not compulsory so as far as medicine is concerned there is alternative medicine science has advanced so there's no problem at all in you following what the modern science says but that doesn't mean you have to disagree with the Sahih Hadith in which the Prophet has given treatment you can also use that you can do both together so if you practice general medicine or practice allopathy medicine which is not the same as the Benabwi there is no harm at all you're not doing a sin but see to it you don't criticize the Hadith in which the Prophet has spoken regarding the cure for many of the diseases Hope that answers the question. Next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sir, I am a student of BSc final year. I am from Andhra Pradesh, India. I am from a Hindu family. Alhamdulillah, I recently reverted into a Muslim. My question is, how one can know whether his Iman is strong or weak? And what steps should be taken in improving my Iman? And if one who listen about the punishment of hellfire and not feeling afraid of it, but worries about other things, what is the strength of his Iman? The question posed is that how will a person, this question posed by Revert, and he's asking that how will a person come to know whether his iman is strong or weak and what steps should be taken to improve the iman and the last part is that if a person hears and knows about the punishment hellfire and yet he's not worried about that and is worried about the worldly things then what is his status Regarding the first part of the question, that how does one come to know that his Iman is strong? A person, when he keeps on following the teachings of Quran and Sayyid Hadith, the more he follows, he realizes that his Iman is strong. For example, when he goes out, a Muslim knows that she should wear the hijab. The outside world may not be doing hijab, she is doing hijab. You know that the Iman is strong, that we know that people do wrong things. They cheat, you are not cheating. People tell lies, you don't lie. You are honest. And the more you follow the Quran and Sahih Hadith, you come to know Iman is strong. How do you increase your Iman? One of the best ways to increase your Iman is to read the translation of the Quran. Read the translation of the Hadith of the beloved Prophet Muhammad Read the Seerah of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Read the Seerah of the Khalfa Rashidin of the Sahabas. When you look at the lifestyle 
you are empowered. You realize that how strong they were in Iman and how weak we are in Iman. So if you read the stories of the Sahabas, your Iman increases. I'd like to give you one incidence that once there was a person who comes and tells the Prophet that the neighbor that is there is not allowing to build the boundary wall of the house because the street is in between. So the Prophet tells the neighbor that if you give that one tree and allow him to build his boundary wall, I will give you a tree in Jannah and refuse it. He doesn't agree. So when one of the Sahaba, Abu Darda, he hears about this, he goes and asks the Prophet that if I get that tree and see to it, give it to him, will I get a tree in Jannah? The Prophet said, yes, why not? So he goes and tells that neighbor that do you know who I am? He said, no. He says, I am Abu Darda who owns the biggest and the most precious garden of dates in Medina. He says, of course. Who does not know you? Then he says that will you give me this tree which is coming in between your neighbor, boundary wall, and for that, in exchange of that tree, I will give you my complete garden of dates, which is the best in Medina. The man says, are you crazy? For my one tree, you will give me the full garden, which is the best in Medina? He says, yes. And the person agrees. Abu Darda comes back home and tells his wife that today I have done a great deal. An excellent deal. The wife asks, what did you do? So he narrates the story about that tree. And he tells his wife that I bought that tree that will give us the tree in Jannah in exchange for the full garden that we have in Medina. So the wife says, ah, what an excellent deal. In today's world, if suppose you have such a big garden and you want to buy the tree, today's wife will tell you, you're a fool. Why did you give the full garden? You would have given 25% of the garden or you should have given 50% of the garden. And surely, that man would have agreed. Even if you give 25% of the garden, you would have given that one tree. But look at the Iman. The wife says, ah, what a deal. That means both of them, the husband and wife, they didn't want even an out of doubt that the person will refuse because they wanted Jannah. And, and the hadith tells us that for the rest of their life they lived a poor life. But they lived a very happy life because they know that the Prophet had promised them paradise. So if we hear the stories of the Sahabas, how they lived, how they sacrificed, how they helped each other, your Iman increases. And it gives us the feeling that what we are doing is nothing. Nothing. And we know that at the time of jihad, when the Prophet told the Sahaba that what you want to contribute and Hazrat Umar may Allah be pleased with him comes and he gives the large wealth to the Prophet and the Prophet asks him that what have you left home? So he says I have left half my wealth at home and half I am giving in charity for jihad. After that later on Hazrat Abu Bakr may Allah be pleased with him he comes and he gives his wealth to the Prophet. And the Prophet asks him, what have you left home? So he said, I have given all my wealth and I have left Allah and his Rasul at home to take care of us. Imagine what Iman. Imagine giving his complete wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you hear these stories, it, it increases our Iman. It makes us feel so small that we can't even contribute to the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't even give charity. If you, if you read the lifestyle, the seerah of the Sahaba, of the Khulfa Rashidin, of the Prophets, we are no way. So if you read the story, the Iman increases. If you read the Quran, the translation, the Iman increases. And you come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your Ibadah increases. Your Salah increases. Your Psalm increases. Your fasting. Your charity. Your 
your your zakat all these things is it, these are signs and when do you realize that iman is increased you have peace of mind wealth cannot buy peace of mind when you have peace of mind that mashallah inshallah we are following allah and his rasul and inshallah we will be raised in jannah with allah and his rasul you know as the prophet said that you will be raised with the people who you love so that time the sahabas were so happy they said we may not be good indeed we may so they were the best after the anbiyas the people who are the most blessed and the closest to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the sahabas among the sahabas of khulfa rashid is number one among the khulfa rashid hadrat abu bakr may allah be pleased with him he is number one then hadrat umar if you if you hear these stories and with the lifestyle of the prophet and the sahabas you will realize that we are living in an air condition we have all the all the facility and yet we crib yet we don't follow the sunnah yet we don't follow the thing that we are supposed to do and if you read how did the uh, the ansar the people of medina the sahabas of medina helped the sahabas the the muhajir who migrated from makkah to medina and the stories it's phenomenal so the more you read the sira and of the prophet of the sahabas your iman will increase your practice will increase and inshallah your peace of mind will increase so that you are more secured that allah will give you the best in this world as well as the akhirah hope that answers Regarding the last part of the question, that what if you hear the punishment in the hellfire, and yet you are bothered about the worldly things? What is the state of Iman? Even after hearing about the punishments of the hellfire, if you do not follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, and yet if you continue worrying about the worldly things, that that means that Iman is weak. That Iman is weak. I told you how Iman is strong, but if you hear if the two thing that makes your iman strong is when you hear about the punishment you fear it so that is the reason when you fear the punishment of the of the year after of the hellfire the present life for you the difficulties are nothing they are peanuts so if after hearing the punishment of the hellfire or after hearing the rewards of janna yet you continue and disobey the teachings of quran and sunna that your iman is very weak so that is the reason you should be in touch with the quran and say hadith and these things will get you closer to allah and his rasul hope that answers the question The next question Assalamu alaikum and namaste Dr Zakir Naik I recently watched your lecture on the similarities of Islam and Hinduism It was so beautiful and I am so impressed with your knowledge on both religions and the scriptures I have one question if you could please answer In the lecture time 2 hours 32 minutes and 9 seconds an individual asked you that you have said that there are so many similarities between islam and hinduism does that mean that according to islam a person can be a hindu in response you have said that if you mean by the term hindu a person who follows the religious scriptures of hinduism then i have got no objection as long as that hindu strictly follows the established truths of the scriptures of hinduism established truths means those truths mentioned in the hindu scripture which have been confirmed by the last and final revelation of god that is the glorious quran and i am referring to vedas and the quran which are mentioned in my lectures both of them they believe that there is one god they believe in the messengers they believe the last 
messenger is Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. They believe in the hereafter. If they believe in all these established facts, I have got no objection. MashaAllah. The revert has repeated my answer in detail, MashaAllah. If this is exactly what the Hindu believes, then what makes them different from a Muslim? Is the word religion just a term at the point, at this point? Can a Muslim and Hindu get married? If not, then why not? I would really appreciate your answer on this. Thank you. In the ending, the question I suppose that if she follows the truth or if that Hindu follows the truth in the Hindu scripture which is established by the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, meaning, you know, if you follow those Hindu scriptures which are established by the teachings of Quran and Sahih Hadith, then what is the difference? Correct, you are right. If the person follows the established teachings in the Hindu scriptures, which is mentioned in the Quran in Sahih Hadith, then he becomes a Muslim. He has to become a Muslim. He has to believe there is one God. He has to believe Prophet Muhammad, the last and final messenger of God. And this is mentioned in the Hindu scriptures. And I have proved in my, in my lecture that even the Hindus believe in one true God who has no image, etc. And they believe also that in the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And these two are the most important criteria for anyone to accept Islam. So my answer was very clear cut that if they are really a true practicing Muslim based on the teachings of the Hindu scriptures which match with the Quran, then they are Muslims. What is the difference? The difference is that Hindu, as I mentioned in my talk, is a geographical definition. Those people living in the land of the Indus Valley Civilization, or those people living in India, they are called as Hindu. It's a geographical definition. It is not a religious definition. The right word should be Vedantist, according to Swami, Swami Vivekananda. A person who follows the Vedas should be called a Vedantist and not a Hindu. A Hindu is a misnomer. So in that context, I am from India, and I live in India, I am a Hindu, by geographical definition. But the real Muslim is a person who submits will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person who believes in the Hindu scriptures, they make the Quran, and they believe that there is one God, and they believe that Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of God, they are Muslims. So they become Muslims. And the right word is Muslim. So, inshallah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may your father and your mother and your brothers and sisters, inshallah, they become Muslims. They, they follow Allah and His Rasul. They worship only one God. And though there are many facilities that is there, but if you believe in one God, and believe in the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you are a Muslim, you enter the fold of Islam. And according to me, you should not delay because you don't know how long a person will live. Whether you want to see tomorrow or not, we don't know. So my request to you would be, do it and see to it that you follow the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Hope that answers the question. The next question, my name is Arman, I am from India. My question is, Islam has prohibited to shake hands with the opposite gender. Because in Islam, it is prohibited to touch a namaram. So my question is, can a man shake hands with a woman while wearing gloves? Please answer as soon as possible. The question posed by Arman is that it is prohibited in Islam for a man to touch a Nahmer woman and he agrees with it, it's haram. But can he touch a woman after wearing gloves? 
means if you are wearing gloves, can he shake hands with a woman? And we know the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is very clear that the Prophet peace be upon him said, it is better to hammer a nail or a needle into the head rather than touch a nahmer. The hadith is very strong, it's very bold, it's very direct. It is preferable to hammer a nail or a needle in the head rather than touch a nahmer woman. So therefore touching Nahmeram is completely haram, it's not prohibited, it is prohibited and it's not permitted. Regarding the question that can you touch a woman wearing gloves? Now there are some hadith in which the Prophet is said to have shaken hands of ladies beneath a cloth. There are a few hadith, but all these hadith are zaif, they are weak. There is no authentic hadith in which the Prophet ever shook hands with ladies. In fact, there are various hadith of Hazrat Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, who is the wife of the Prophet, saying that the Prophet in his life has never touched any Namera woman. So based on this, it is not permitted to shake hands with women, neither is it permitted to shake hands wearing a glove. Because yet, even if you wear a glove and you shake hands, of course, it's haram. There's going to be feelings. You cannot say nothing is happening to you. So it's not permitted to shake hands with glove or without glove. Both are prohibited. The next question on the WhatsApp. My name is Rafsanul Haq. I am a student from Bangladesh. My question is, many atheists claim that can Allah create a stone that he cannot lift? I generally answer them by saying that this question is illogical and self-contradictory. But they say that Allah is transcend transcendent and he is not bound by any contradictions. Since he is not bound by any contradictions, so why he can't create a stone that he cannot lift? So how to answer this question? And this is a common question asked even in the times of when I was in school, that can God create anything and everything? And we say yes. Can God destroy anything and everything? And we say yes. So can God create a stone which he cannot destroy? And you're stuck. If you say yes also you're wrong. If you say no also you're wrong. And a similar question. Can God create anything and everything? We say yes. Can God lift anything and everything? We say yes. So can he create a stone which he cannot lift? So these questions actually, as you rightly said, they are illogical. Because, for example, if I say that there is a tall short man, it doesn't have any meaning. You can either have a tall man or a short man or you can have a medium man. You can't have a tall short man. It's meaningless. For example, if I say that there is a fat thin man, you either have a fat man or a thin man. You can't have a fat thin man because it's meaningless. So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only does godly things. He does not do ungodly things like creating a stone which you cannot lift. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not lie. Because to lie is against the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah, Allah says in the Quran, he is never unjust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot do injustice. Allah says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 40, he is never and just in the least degree. Furthermore, Allah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never forgets. Allah says in Surah Ta, chapter number 20, verse number 52, Allah never forgets. So Allah cannot forget. It is against 
the the benevolence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forget. So here we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all powerful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot do ungodly things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only does godly things. He doesn't do ungodly things. <laughs> That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the highest. And what we can learn is we learn from the seerah of the Prophet and the incidences which increases our Iman. Hope that answers the question. The next question, my name is Sohrab. I am a student and live in USA. I had a question that I hope you can give the answer. If God forgives everyone's sin, what if a person do all good deeds but at exchange only wants from God to forgive Iblis, Satan? If this wish, is this wish acceptable? If not, then what the promise that God gives us that he will accept any dua? The question posed by Saurabh is that if Allah is going to accept every dua, he is given the promise. So if we do good deeds and we tell Allah to forgive Iblis, will he forgive Iblis? If he doesn't, then Allah hasn't kept his promise. Point number one, nowhere does Allah anywhere in the Quran or any authentic hadith says that he will accept all your dua. It is your wrong concept. It's a misconception that you have. What Allah says that if you truly repent, then Allah will forgive any sin of yours. So however much big sin you do, as long as you repent sincerely with your heart, Allah will forgive you. So that's the reason that if a person sins, he truly repents, he asks for forgiveness, stop what he is doing, agree it is wrong, never does it again, Allah will surely forgive him. But here your question is that if I do good deeds and I ask Allah to forgive Iblis, nowhere does Allah say that Allah will fulfill all your duas. If Iblis truly repented, if Iblis would have repented to Allah and said he's sorry, he'll never do it again, inshallah Allah will forgive him. But Allah knows Iblis is not going to do that. We know that. So where is the question? And you saying that you do good deeds and ask Allah to forgive Iblis. No, where does Allah say that he's going to believe in all your duas? Allah will forgive your sin if you truly repent and you compensate, Allah will forgive. But that doesn't mean that you do some good deeds and you ask Allah to forgive Iblis. This is not there anywhere and this is a misconception. Hope that answers the question. Dear Doctor, Assalamu Alaikum, Wa Alaikum Assalam Wa Barakatuh. I am Abdul Rashid from Qatar. I need information about your Urdu TV channel. I am not receiving it since three years ago in Qatar. I am getting this channel information from Google too. Is it running or stopped? Please send some information about Urdu TV channel, whether it's available in Qatar or not.
the question posed by the brother is that he has been watching peace tv urdu since a long time but since 3 years he is not getting the urdu islamic channel the name of the channel is peace tv urdu so he is asking that is the channel running how can he see it alhamdulillah we have got four satellite channels which are 24 by 7 number 1 is peace tv english number 2 is peace tv urdu number 3 is peace tv bangla and number 4 is peace tv chinese as far as our satellite channels are concerned we see to it that we are present on multiple satellites the more number of satellites you are present is more, more number of eyeballs the more number of people are watching our first channel peace tv english was launched in 2006 then we launched peace tv urdu in 2009 then we launched peace tv bangla in 2011 and we launched peace tv chinese input in 2015 as far as peace tv is concerned peace tv started in 2009 and since its inception it's growing it's always there so you are not able to watch peace tv in qatar maybe your dish has got shifted or the direction of your dish, this dish has shifted as far as Qatar is concerned there are two satellites which show peace tv urdu one is the arab sat the other is the intelsat 20 the arab sat is watched more by the arabs who know arabic as a language the non-arabs they watch other satellite and the other famous satellite is that it is the Intelsat 20. So Alhamdulillah we are present on both. On, on Arabsat which is very famous among the Arab world. It, is, it covers the whole of the Middle East. It covers the whole of Europe. And very beneficial. But the Peace TV is also seen on Intelsat 20. Which is seen more by the Asian people, the Indian, the Pakistani. And on Asian Sat, Asia Sat 20, Intersat 20, sorry, not Asia Sat, Intersat 20, it is the satellite which has the largest footprint. It covers more than 70% of the world population. It is seen in Middle East, it's seen in India, it's seen in the Indian subcontinent, all the countries, that is uh, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Mali, etc. So, Peace TV is present in Qatar since 2006, the Urdu, the Peace TV Chinese, uh, the Peace TV Urdu is present in 2009 and even today is present. Only thing you have to shift your dish. So, if you shift your dish in the angle of 68 degrees east, then inshallah you will be able to watch and see Peace TV Urdu. And recently, or maybe four years back, we are even telecasting our Peace TV Urdu and Peace TV English on Paksat, on Pakistan Sat. So, the brothers came, they set up and they went away. But now, it's also available on Paksat, thus the viewership of Peace TV has increased. But previously, people only used to watch on, on the other platform. So, the more number of satellites that you are in a particular region, the more number of eyeballs because Arab sat is mainly watched by, by the Arabs. They don't watch Asia sat or Intel sat. So, that is the reason that we started even pack sat so that more of the Urdu audience can watch. So, now at present we are on three satellites and all three are covering the Middle East and even covering uh, Singapore and also covering the other countries. So, the, by this network, Alhamdulillah, Peace TV Urdu is seen on three satellites in Qatar, that is Arabsat, Intersat 20 as well as Asiasat, Asiasat 7. So, hope that answers the question.
the next question assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh sir i am arif khan a 22 year old from kolkata india i want to know from many days your style and methodology of dawa which is very effective how do you prepare for dawa or what is your style of research because whenever you answer something or present something you very nicely topple down opponent's claim with very beautiful and unique hikma for instance if someone speaks an islam on islamic terrorism then you counter argue with some informative things that ultimately destroys their claim please tell me how you gather such information and how you structure it and how you prepare and what is your homework please let me please sir tell me your routine and what things do you take for research and how do you do research your dawa affected me so much alhamdulillah please help me with some bit of information or some tricks notes etc if this message really reaches you then please give me feedback may allah protect you and give more hid- haya amin jazakallah khair the brother arif khan has been watching my videos and he appreciates the way i do dawa and he says he likes the way how i use my hikma and i reply to the opponent and i topple him over or or rather i would say i win him over because allah says in the quran in in surah fusilat chapter number 41 verse number 34 that you should win over your enemies winning your winning over your enemies is more important than defeating them so win them over so we were as far as the question that how do i do my research and how do i give the reply and it has been described normally if i'm supposed to give a talk on women that is islam i see to it that i read all the verses in the quran dealing with women then i try and collect various hadith dealing with women so that whatever question that can come on women inshallah we should be able to answer so the preparation is very important when you're giving a lecture the lecture that you give should be hardly 10 to 20 percent you should have five times more knowledge than the lecture i've given so that you can handle the question answer question answer is more important when a person we come to know how much is he in water so and regarding knowing a course the best advice i can give you is that you can watch the course let's become effective dais international law training program it's present in on the alida and if you go on the alida platform you'll find hundreds of courses and some of them are on compared religion on dawa and this will tell you in detail how you should do research how you should uh, how you should present yourself and how can you win over your enemies hope that answers the question The next question I am Rushan from Sri Lanka I am a Hindu by birth but I never believed in Hinduism or an, or another religion from my school time till now but I trust believe and follow Islam same time I never convert as a Muslim because of my parent so I would like to know what should I do about it I am working at health and life insurance company in sri lanka 
our company invests the premiums for government treasury bonds and doing more business like electronic devices hospitals foods i am working at, at health and life insurance company in sri lanka a company invests the premiums for government treasury bonds and doing more business like electronic devices hospital foods cities exports and imports etc i sell more policies with without any kind of extra money they only get what they saved for entire term at maturity in them hospitalization they can settle the hospital bill by using a policy in death or disability they can claim some extra bonus if someone thinks it's interest what can i do for it the question posed by rushan from sri lanka that he is hindu by birth but never believed in hinduism full life and he believed in islam same time never converted as a muslim because of parents so like to know what should i do as far if you believe in islam and you believe in the teachings of allah subhanahu wa taala and the last and final message my first request to you would be that see to it you you accept islam as long as you believe there's one god and you believe there's no one else that deserve worship and you believe that prophet muhammad is the messenger of god then my request to you would be that immediately as soon as possible accept islam because we do not know how long we'll live i am not sure whether i'll live tomorrow whether i'll see tomorrow or not so if you as you said you studied hinduism and you agree with it and you want to accept islam my request to you would be see to it that you don't delay don't wait for the right occasion along with some birthday of someone else or don't don't wait that you know you will do it later on my advice to you would be that see to it that you accept islam as soon as possible coming to your second question that you involved in in some of the transaction which involves in riba there's insurance there are two types of insurance one is the general insur insurance which is there and the other is the islamic insurance called as takaful so if you involve and get if you put something in takaful or islamic insurance which takes care of you but if you go to the conventional insurance it deals with riba and they will have a different line and that's not acceptable in islam because riba is a major sin but so what you have to do is that if we are dealing with conventional insurance we deal with riba you should leave it and see to it that don't do it again but if it is somewhat like the thing that it is based on islamic sharia if it's takaful then there is no problem and it's permitted hope that answers the question this will be the last question before we end the session assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam i am hafiz from pakistan why allah has revealed four islamic books or revelations why did he not complete his religion in one book as he knows the knowledge of future he could have revealed only one book which could be useful for all the periods of times like till qiyama only quran will be implemented upon so that there were no divisions in the religion for so let me correct you brother hafiz that allah has not revealed only four books allah says in the quran in surah rad chapter number 13 verse number 38 allah says wa qul li ajlin kitab in every age have we sent a revelation but by name only four are mentioned in the quran the torah the zabur the injil and the quran torah is the wahi the revelation 
which was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi, the revelation which was given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But there were many other revelations besides these four which are mentioned in the Quran. For example, Sufa Ibrahim, the books given to Prophet Ibrahim, peace be upon him. But by name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. Now, your basic question that why did Allah reveal so many revelations? Why doesn't he reveal only one book and that's it till Qiyamah? It's like my son telling me, Abba, father, I want to become a doctor. So why don't you admit me directly into a medical college? Why should I go to nursery, then go to kindergarten, then go to first standard, then primary school, then secondary school, and then go to a medical college? Why don't you give me admission directly into a medical college? So similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom, he revealed best what was required at that time. First he revealed the Torah, then the then he revealed the Zabur, then he revealed the Injil. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that earlier if we had revealed the Quran, people may not be able to understand it, may not be, be able to follow it. So what has Allah done when Allah knew at this age, 1400 years ago, at this time, Alhamdulillah, human beings can understand the Quran and can follow it and can implement it. So Allah in his divine wisdom, because he is the creator of the human being, he knows it. So when at the right time, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realized 1400 years ago, that this is the time that human beings can absorb and can implement, he revealed it. Before that, he revealed the other scriptures. The basic message of Tawhid was there, but it was different. So, 1400 years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the last and final revelation, which Allah knew at this time, the people can understand it, can implement it and follow it. So, this is the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He revealed the other, other scriptures first. And then last, he revealed the last and final revelation of the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious Quran, at the right and appropriate time. Hope that answers the question. And this was the last question that we could handle. Till we meet next time. Inshallah, next Saturday, there will not be any question answer session because my son. Sheikh Farik Naik is travelling abroad and even I will be in Perlis next Saturday. Inshallah we will meet two weeks from now that is on the 3rd of February. Inshallah till then. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh wa akhirul dawan alhamdulillah.